Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. So, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? Pretty good. Are you good? Are you doing as good as double Grand Prix standard action? <laughs> well, uh, without any judgment about this particular standard versus others, this was a this was a pretty good weekend. Yeah, I think like you know, given given how much mileage uh, a lot of these archetypes have theoretically had. This past weekend was was pretty crazy. I mean, like, the red aggro decks were weird, and there was, like, you know, the grinding decks were different, and it's just all, all over the place. <clears throat> right, and uh, funny enough, uh, Teferi's comeback was <laughs> armed by a return of approach of the second son, taking down the, the, the trophy in uh, Orlando, you know, stateside. So... Gabriel Joglar's deck, um, the the blue white approach uh, in in the American Grand Prix, like you said, uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, I think that you know Teferi decks, you know from from the various builds, you know blue white, blue white approach, Esper, of course the uh, the Turbo Fog deck from the Pro Tour. I think blue white approach does the best of going over the top of other Teferi decks. Uh, yeah, I mean, if they've got enough, like, you you can end up into these really, really long, drawn-out, like, Ipnu Rivulet games if somebody doesn't just snowball some kind of a card advantage situation. Trying to win with permanence is so tough, and it's hard for these decks to have very many counterspells. So if you just play super, super patiently, if you've got, uh, you know, if you've got a couple approach to the second sun and they've got a couple and they've, they've just got the four to fairies, you know, like, you know, everything else being equal, you got, you're going to have a little bit of an edge there. Or if they have one gear Hulk or something like that, you know? Well, I was just thinking if you're playing the approach to the second sun deck and let's say you're playing against the Bant Nexus deck, which is, you know, coming out of the pro tour, this was like, the hype deck, the highest profile, new, different archetype deck. Like, the Bant Nexus deck has got... It's got Teferi. It might have Oath of Teferi. It's got Nissa, maybe. It's got Karn. But it's really just, like, a bunch of fogs and card drawing, right? Like, there's not a single card in this deck that can really stop you from just casting Approach the Second Sun and killing them, right? Is there? In the entire main deck. I mean, the the biggest thing they have is uh, when you tap out to approach of the second sun, they tap out to Nexus of Fate. It, and that could go badly for you, right? It's possible they string, I don't know, a hundred of those together, right? <laughs> could go really bad. But if you have a window, I mean, you can mess them up. And it's like, oh, definitely. Well, it was, it's actually something important to note. As long as you don't get mana locked, like... They're fogs, and they're, like, you know, just taking over the game inevitably. It doesn't save them from Approach of the Second Sun. They have to mana lock you. So if they – because, like, if you can only cast one Approach, then they can actually win. They can, you know, obviously you can't cast the second one. But, like, if if they're just sitting around – trying to destroy all your land, you know, exile all your land with uh, Teferi, if they can't get you off of seven mana in time, well, then nothing else in their deck can interact with you other than them beating down <laughs> with the two Karns. Oh, yeah. I mean, but that, that'll that work. You know, <laughs> that can work, you know, if you've got... No, 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 but what I mean is that, like, if you... Okay, so it's a very short clock, because if you play Approach, you know, it's not seven turns later because of all this card draw realistically they've only got like a couple turns like two or three turns if that right and if they've got a teferi on the tape even if they have a teferi emblem it, you know it depends on how long the game has gone out but my point is that if they end step uh nexus of fate untap and teferi they're still not going to get you in time so uh, I yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, they obviously they board in like a lot of counter spells after sideboarding. If, if but I'm, it's not like it's not like that's going to make them win. Oh no! If I'm playing game one, I, I've played this kind of deck so many times against other blue decks, and at least if I had the scout because I was aware of the kind of decks that were played at the Pro Tour, which have really just no real interaction with uh, 
with the approach decks game plan, you could just sit there and use all of your your um, glimmers and hieroglyphic illuminations and searches, etc., to just get to fourteen lands and then just cast two approaches in one turn. Like certainly, you are going to be able to outmana them with Gabriel's deck with a negate four disallows and to some degree even cast out in blink of an eye right you can manage their planeswalkers pretty well relative to how much mana that that they're using and then plus you've got like some incidental stuff that could just mess them up like field of ruin for example um i think that the interesting thing here is that it might be frustrating for you to try to if new rival at them sometimes then you just flip some nexus that's kind of funny but um you know, I, I think like just 14 lands in play kill you is uh, probably a pretty reasonable uh, strategy here. Yeah, I mean, you know, I yeah, yeah, I think so. Like, what are they going to do? Like, really? <laughs> Discard some fogs, you know, like they're going to cast a planeswalker. Sometimes you're counting to counter it and sometimes you're just going to cast it out like just not not scary. I think um, in game one, obviously. I'm, I'm just looking at... It. It's just the sheer quantity of dead cards. Oh, yeah. They have, like, a bazillion fogs. Like, yeah. Yeah. But I do think that the approach is uh, important uh, because I think that if you're just playing with four Teferis and a Torrential Gear Hulk, I don't think that the blue-white matchup is nearly as good as if you have two approaches in your oh, deck. absolutely agree with you. I mean, if you're just, like, playing a Teferi deck, right, they're just a Teferi deck also, but they have Man Acceleration, and they have, like, now all of a sudden, I think the balance of power shifts into into the Nexus of Fate deck's hands because they have, like, these infinite time walks that they can that they can be test-spelling you with, that no, almost no matter what you do, they're going to be able to get back depending on, on how long the game goes. So, you know, like, I think that the approach deck's advantage is that ability to kill you in, you know just one turn with, you know, 14 lane of play, which is just not, not hard to accomplish. Um, and so, I mean, especially when you're talking about stuff like flipping a search for his Kanta for man acceleration and, and whatnot, if you, especially just using your card drawing to just get lands, it's a, it's no biggie. Dude, I, I got to imagine that this second place deck is like, Kyle Cooper's uh, Orlando deck has got to be a stand uh, a a deck after your own heart. I I when I first saw Kyle Cooper's deck, I think that the title on it was just like Mono Red Wizards, and then I didn't I didn't look back initially, and then only when I went for a second pass, looking over all the decks this week, I was just like, wait a minute, how many lands does this deck have? Flame of what? And then, and then I stopped and looked at this deck. Wow, this deck. So this deck is 19 lands, demonstrably fewer lands than we've seen in um, in most of the red aggro decks in standard. We we typically see 24, I think, in in a mono red aggro deck. This one's only at 19, and it's got like a ton of fast drops, like four yeah. Earth Shaker Kendra, four Get to Lava Runner, four Soul Scar Mage, four Viachino Pyromancer. But that ain't nothing, man. Four Bowman Courier. Yeah, that none of that's anything. It's the three flame of Keld. <laughs> this man means business, Kyle Cooper. Flame of Keld. Chapter one with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait till you see the second act. <laughs> yeah, the flame of Keld is a. Uh, it's an interesting one. If you're about to be hell bent. You know, like it's it's not only a draw to it's potentially a furnace of wrath, you know. I mean, I'm a little torn on on the proper construction of this archetype. I feel like I mean, just I guess if you're if you're going the way that you want to go, you want to drop your hand, right? Get your hand low, if not to nothing, then play Flame of Keld, right? That's what you want to do so that you, you have a minimal number of cards that you're discarding when it goes off and then. Um, you know, take advantage of, of drawing cards and, and, and you know, getting the, the damage increase from Chapter 3. But I feel like 19 lands is counterproductive, right? Like, don't you want to help drop cards out nah. of here? No? Nah, because you want to take your time before you drop the Flame of Keld anyway. You want to have a higher percentage of those, those, you know, those, like, you only have a few cards after you've discarded your hand to really take advantage of the Flames of Keld? 
you want those cards to be as few land as possible at that point. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'd have to test this thing. I, I, I'm just imagining it right now. But right now I'm imagining like 19 lands and th- I mean, I guess there's a 20th land of the sideboard. But I don't know how he ever casts Hazaret. Like, <laughs> well, he has a mountain in the sideboard. That's that's right there. That's a sign. That's like sometimes if you want to be able to afford to cast Hazaret, you need to board in more land. Yeah, I mean, I, but I don't know that a 20th is really... <laughs> Dude, the Flames of Kel fixes your mana. It does. Uh, I guess Flame of Kel is just everything. It's everything. Dude, I, seriously, though, in all seriousness... When you have the Flame of Keld and you drop Goblin Chain Warler, that is living. <laughs> Dude, think about it. That's so good. So you, you've got Goblin Chain Whirler, which is, you know, a 3-3 three, three damaging everything sort of ability, right? But the Flame of Keld's... I, I guess you're talking about the, thir- num- the, the, the Chapter 3 ability, right? Of course. If a red source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player this turn. It deals that much damage plus two to that permanent or player instead. So if you, if you've got like the, the chapter three going and then you drop goblin chain whirler, it's just more damage than I can count. I'm not that good at math, right? That's game boys. It's that much damage. Um, but I, I hope that you have the, the third mana necessary to cast it with your 19 lands, but you probably do. That's, that's about how, like, modern and, and, uh, and legacy red decks are built with, like, 19 or 20 lands. I'm sure, I'm sure that, that Kyle can accomplish this. Dude, actually, speaking of legacy, before I forget, wanted a correction. <laughs> Dude, completely botched it last week on discussing the Monarch. Yeah, I got the monarch mixed up with the uh, with the voting of uh, of some of the other conspiracy cards. The monarch does have abilities, uh, you know, like the whole uh, like there there really there can only be one monarch, but the monarch at the end of the monarch's end step, they get an extra card. That's awesome. So, so like a personal howling mine is like no joke, right? Well, especially and, when combined with a fiend hunter, right? Like that's pretty cool. Right. And then uh, somebody else can actually become the monarch. You know, there are cards that do it explicitly. But once somebody is a monarch, if you deal uh, if you deal combat damage with a creature to the monarch, they steal the monarchness. Now, in Legacy, not a lot of people are hitting you with creatures and the the white, you know, the white decks using the jailer. They're usually the ones that are doing the attacking. It's hard to actually hit them with creature damage in a game that isn't already decided. Mm. So, yeah, the Monarch is a big game. It's a big, big game. Yeah, so I think that that makes the Jailer not really worse because unless people are... No, playing, better! Are you kidding? No, the yeah, extra but, card! But you could, here's the thing that's the downside on it, right? If they actually kill your Jailer and then smash you and get the Monarch, then they get the personal Howling Mine. You've opened the door to them becoming the monarch now, right? Like, that's, that's the only thing. Yeah, but that's because you are still the monarch. Even if they kill the jailer, you're literally still the monarch. No, but not if they kick you in the head. Then they're the monarch. How are they going to kick you in the head? You're with, playing the white deck. You played a feet. one drop, two drop, a three drop? They're, no. No, I'm saying they kill the monarch, and then you, like, okay, so you're playing against the decks in Legacy. Most of them, can, half of them can't even attack you <laughs> anyway, best case scenario. <laughs> now, to the half that can attack you, they probably can't attack you because you're playing the white deck. I'm saying that when you're playing against one of these freaking, like, Sultai decks or something, right, like, if you're just, if you're playing against like uh, a play, a, a, you're playing a sneak and show. It doesn't matter whatever it is you're doing. If you just play the jailer and they kill it, a personal howling mine that is very difficult for them to interact with is as real as the streets. So what you're saying is, if I attack you with I don't know something like 19 goblins, the fact that I have the monarch is not that significant. Nor if I attack you with a 15, 15. Yeah, it's like okay, you attack me with Emrakul. You're the monarch. <laughs> I've got, got a monarch. it. <laughs> got it, dude. <laughs> Give me my crown along with your permanence. Yes, that's uh, that's what I'm saying. With feet, Patrick, to the head, kicking. 
So the uh, the other the other red deck in the top eight wasn't nearly so exciting, but it did feature a couple twists, namely uh, three. Co- you know, it's so funny the up to three unlicensed disintegrations is the the big shift, and then multiple main deck Aether Sphere harvesters and a lost legacy in the sideboard. Lost legacy is. I think Lost Legacy is the most underplayed card in Standard right now. I think finding uh, places where you can sideboard Lost Legacy is going to be valuable. It's it's so it's it, it offers uh, especially to non blue decks like this is a non blue deck. It offers a meaningful way to cut off these Teferi decks to cut off Nexus of Fate. in particular Nexus of Fate right like it doesn't matter how many times you duress Nexus of Fate or negate Nexus of Fate. That doesn't do anything. You got a you got a lost legacy nexus of fate. Otherwise, like if you don't kill them, they're just eventually just going to nexus of fate you roughly a thousand times. I think, on average, a thousand. Mm, I I'll take the under. Yeah, but the uh, the nexus of fate deck uh, not as good without the nexus of fate. To be sure, I I just think that enough of these decks though. If you if you lost legacy, uh, yeah, I guess you have to pick your spots. I mean, obviously, lost legacy on approaches is, is the bomb. But well, I mean, imagine how many how many spots are you how many spots are you really boarding it in? So, I think that uh, I, I think I think it's a meaningfully good card to play two or more copies of, it, like in black green, for example, not just in black red. But if I were playing this black red deck and I sided in Lost Legacy and I had it on an open to cast against the Nexus of Fate deck, I'd probably just cast it against Teferi. Well, I think isn't that the main reason you just want to name Teferi against everybody, right? Like, I mean, the not everybody, only Teferi decks. Be it the Nexus of Fate deck can't even get into a choke point where they're like infinite Nexus of Fate if they don't have Teferi, and like even if they do, what are they going to do? Take a bunch of turns and then what? Or they Karn. Can't, yeah, like I mean. My entire rest of my deck against their Karn and their Nissa isn't so scary to me. Oh, I agree. I agree. Right, so that's that's what I'm thinking. I think that I would just lost Legacy there to fairies, but uh, they're all good targets. I, I, mean, I, I think I think you just want to name to fairy against so many people. I think you know, every to fairy deck is so overly reliant on that card. Yeah, the other thing I like about it in in decks that have creatures, like, I mean, obviously, like, if you're bringing in Lost Legacy and, like, Ramp or something, like, something that's not pressuring an opponent blue deck and, like, forcing them to tap mana in a, in maybe a, uh, like, a kind of temporally inconvenient way, right? You just, you don't, you don't generate the same opens, but, like, this kind of a deck, you're just, like, guy, guy, and, like, they're forced to settle or they're forced to fumigate. You just can, like... You can actually land your Lost Legacy before they even can cast the Teferi. I think that's yep. like very good. Versus like a lot of these decks that are like a mid-range deck, like some kind of Ali and Trazi deal or like a, an Hour of Promise deck. Like, what, what are you really doing that's going to... Like, you might be able to resolve it, but if you resolve it after they've got shenanigans going, it's so much less meaningful, and it might be too late. Right? It's like casting Blood Moon in... In um in modern after they've gone off right all right you're not casting any more spells and you're like well I do have a creature you can't kill <laughs> you're dead in three turns <sighs> yep that is true <laughs> fair enough fair enough dude uh I I mean first of all I guess you know congrats to Corey uh, for his you know Corey Brooker obviously top aided but it threw me when I saw the lists I. <laughs> When I saw this Grixis mid-range deck played by uh, Ars- uh, Arseniv, uh, by Mr. Egorov, I uh, I would have thought that this was Corey's deck. <laughs> this is like a standard version of the the deck that co- that Corey plays in every single modern tournament. Those are just the cards he owns, right? Dude, one cast down, one commit to memory, one consign. Like the, the, I uh, love consign to oblivion. I know you have always love consign. Card to oblivion. is so good. One disallow, one essence scatter, one Bantu's last reckoning, one doomfall, and and then it's not like there isn't like tons of other twos. I mean, a braid is the only four of in the deck. 
Um, yeah, just and that's counting out. the land. Just shout out to Doomfall. You know, I was never hot on that card, even though when way back when it was our preview card. But that card is awesome. I underrated it for a long time. That card is awesome. Um, you should Doomfall. You should Doomfall often against the Nexus of Fate deck. It deals with their Nexus of Fate, and like if they do something cute, like bring in Carnage Tyrant, it deals with that too. I think you're like real focused on this Nexus of Fate deck, considering that. It didn't exactly have a very good weekend, did it? No, no, no. I just think it's hype. I, I think I, I like I, we talked well, about last it week. Is. Like I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's like a one of these decks that's going to have a sustained career. Yeah, but how much popularity did it even have? It was super hype for you know a window. I didn't say how much hype it had. How much popularity? Like how many people actually played it? Well, one person made top eight between two Grand Prix. Right. So. And, uh, you know, not exactly a quantum leap forward in the archetype, right? Oh, no, 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 no. He, he has a full Nissa different than, <laughs> than that Karn at the first He's got the one spring to mind, too. That is cute. I, I told you, I like the spring to mind. Yeah. And to be fair, Oath of Teferi was not, like, standard everywhere. But I think Oath of Teferi is also an awesome card. I mean, if you get all these things going, it doesn't matter. Your deck just looks phenomenal. If, if everything lines up. But I think that if people are playing, like, blue white approach and that that's the matchup i think you have like a zero percent chance of winning game one if they play correctly so again that's just not that's just not good enough if uh if to fairy decks and like black blue control and black blue mid-range like Corey played are are the norm it, it just not enough juice that that nexus fate deck no but actually over in that uh in the same gp actually you could just just yeah, talk about uh, Corey's deck for a second, because we talked about the deck that he didn't. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. But, like, if you just look at the construction of this deck, first of all, even though it's a bunch of creature removal cards, like Fatal Push, for example, um, he's got also got, like, Champion of Wits to just, like, fix his draw. Like, if that's, like, the most boring thing you can do, but, like, just fixing your draw, that's okay. Right? I mean, it's not, that's not totally it, right? Like, he's, he's playing three, the Scarab God... Oh, yeah. And a Liliana. So, like, he's kind of, like, meaning it with Champion of the Wits, of Champion of Wits. I mean, I'm just saying, like, Champion of Wits does many things here, and fixing your draw is not the worst when you're playing against that. No, deck. no, this, not at all. This deck actually relies on creature damage to actually win. Um, but then, like, separately, you're just like, oh, yeah, creature control cards aren't very good against Nexus of Fate. Well, Vraska's Contempt is fantastic against Nexus of Fate, right? So if you just get, like, anything, like, I don't know, a Glint Sleeve Siphoner that's not going anywhere, right? Because even if they're fogging, they don't kill it very well, right? And that's just the thing that you're trying to ride, you know, through. Dude, I'm, I, I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Teferi decks and uh, Nico Bolas decks, uh... And red black like chain roller decks. That's where we. That's what we got to be focused on beating, man. These Nexus of Fate decks. Let's let's have them earn their keep before getting such a share, man. I mean, I'm just saying. Corey's got Argyle's Bloodfest and Doomfall in his main deck. This matchup is a murdering for Nexus of Fate. I'm just I'm agreeing with you when I say this, right? Like. And this is a deck that's got a ton of committed essence scatters, fatal pushes, etc. I think it's a murdering in Corey's favor. Uh, is there any uh, aspect of this besides the one hostage taker, one ravenous chupacabra split that uh, that we really need to dig any deeper on? I mean, that's just style, right? Due to options. I mean, just shout out to Vizier of Many Faces, which he's got in his sideboard. That card is outstanding. I don't know why that card doesn't see more play than it does. It's so good. It is so good. Like, it, it, every single time I side it in, I ask myself, why don't you have four copies of this? You can't lose if you draw it, right? Like, it's it's so good. And it only costs four mana. Yep. But it's not necessarily uh, at its best against decks like uh, this new breed of Teferi deck. Wafo Tapa's Esper Control deck. Oh. And both Wafo made top eight and Dazani, Jeremy Dazani, actually won the tournament. Took it all. So your old sparring partner, Guillaume Wafo Tapa, the control master. Are they, they play Jeremy Dema- 
Uh, yeah, and Jeremy Dazani's no slouch either. When it comes to the control, I mean, I, for all I know, he may have built the lion's share or all of this deck. I mean, he's definitely made more than his fair share of control decks over the years. I mean, he won a Pro Tour with Islands in front of him, didn't he? Uh, so, uh, yeah, definitely this deck is... I mean, it's a very Wafo Tapa style of deck. It's not just that there's, you know, four Glimmer of Genius and uh, four Torrential Gear Hulk. And, you know, like, the, Wafo is all, you got to remember, Wafo is also the guy who wants to play a lot of Broodmate Dragons. But I don't think they have the same 75 because Wafo is still Wafo. His change, I think he has two extra Hieroglyphic Illuminations. On top of all the other, you know, on top of the four Gear Hulks, three Teferis, the Search for Azkanta, the four Glimmers. Wafo just likes to draw cards, you know. Oh, so Dasani's got Cast Down, right? I gotta right. say, Cast Down, it, it's such a such a minor looking card at one and a B for, you know, destroyed target non-legendary creature. Um, but when I was testing, like, real seriously for the RPTQ, like, a few months ago, I, it was the highest performing deck. I'm sorry, highest performing card that I tried. It was, like, always, always good. Like, consistently, surprisingly good. Um, even when you're like, oh, this isn't that good. It kills their torrential <laughs> gear hole. It's fine, right? Like, sometimes you just need to kill their guy. Somebody's got to do it. And it's two mana. Like, they could have a really good guy, and you just kill it, and it was two, and you just just go about your business of drawing two extra cards. <laughs> that's what that's what I found with that card. But, yeah, I, I thought this Esper Control deck was just such the breakout deck. I mean, there was also a third member, uh, Arnie Hushenbeth. Uh, apologies in the name, but uh, – also, his list, very similar to Dazani's. Three copies in the top eight, including the title. Not a bad showing. Oh, yeah. So let's go through some of the uh, the details on this. So all of them played Search for Ascanta. Um, Arnie played two copies, and the Pro Tour champs uh, played one each only. I think the distinguishing characteristic of, about this strategy is only three copies of Teferi here of Dominaria, but four copies of Torrential Gear Hulk in all three that made top eight in uh, mm-hmm. in the yep. European Grand Prix. Yep. Um, and then they're just, they're like not so all over the place. Like there's like a pretty limited range in all these instances that they're playing, but you know, it looks like four Vraska's Contempts across the board, a couple of Syncopates, if not three Syncopates, if you're Wafo. And then, get, you know, some of the details, you know, one cast down, two cast down, zero cast down. Um, but they're, well, they're, they're, they're all in a similar range. There is a little bit of a twist if you check out their sideboard. So to begin with, while uh, Dazani and Arnie had uh, Chromium, uh, you know, one Chromium in the board, Wafo just went with a, the Scarab God for his alternate kill condition. And then uh, the one that I thought was kind of exotic... Wafo's got uh, two copies of Infernal Reckoning, which is that uh, black instant exile target colorless creature. You gain life equal to its power. So two copies of Infernal Reckoning. Um, And then uh, Arnie had one and Dazani had none. But what do you make of that? Do you think there's really enough, like, constructs, you know? I, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to cast this card, and instead of gaining five, I'm going to lose five. Like, I, I feel like that's what's going to happen with this card a lot of the time. They're going to shoot you with the ballista? Yeah, they're just going to shoot you with the ballista. I mean, like, it's there are obviously cards that you could you cheat it, but, like, the most prominent artifact creature. I mean, unless, I guess... Scrubbing Scrounger is the most prominent artifact creature. Oh, that's fair. And it exiles it. That's good. I guess it's also... A fast, cheap way to interact with cards like Heart of Kieran, right? That's yeah. I think the big thing though is Scrap Heap Scrounger. You know, like you can backdoor the Bowmat Courier on time, which yeah. isn't bad. But I think the big thing is that you just really got to exile Scrap Heap Scrounger. That's fair. That's fair. That's solid. Uh, the other one is both Dizani and Wafo had Detection Tower as their extra land in the sideboard. Their twenty eighth land, Detection Tower. Well. First of all, I'm just a big respecter of just playing extra lands anyway in your side. Particularly, you got 27 in the main. Sure, put a 28th in the board. Let's do it. Well, if you're the kind of guy who only plays one field of ruin, you know, just uh, 
just play the detection tower because uh, you're just assuming that other people aren't going to be able to shoot at it. But it does have that extra ability, right? So tap for colorless comes into play untapped. These are solid, solid attributes of an extra land. And then, of course, it has the one and a tap until end of turn. Um, your opponents and <clears throat> excuse me and creatures your opponents control with hexproof can be the target of spells and abilities you control as though they didn't have hexproof. So, are we shooting at vine mares? Who are we going at with uh, with detection tower? Well, I mean, so obviously vine mares one uh, one option, but there's also stuff like, for instance, chromium the mutable. Oh. You know, chromium's not a bad little uh, a bad little number. Um, and uh, likewise, uh, is it palladium ores? So uh, we're going dragon hunting with detection tower. Yeah, I think I think uh, vine mare is you know numero uno, but beyond that, uh, mostly just dragons. I mean, it is nice if you're if you're in the control battle and everybody else just has chromium the mutable as their way to go over the top, and then you're Wafo and you just use detection tower to stop the chromium the mutable, and instead you just the scare god them into next Tuesday. Yeah, I I think that I think that that detection tower versus chromium is a sweet little one upsmanship, but I still think that if I were in the you know tuning sideboard zone. Uh, for fighting other control decks, I would. I think I would still rather be on the Chromium side of that fight. <laughs> How do you feel? I don't know, man. I, I like to be. I like to have surprise on my side. Wild card. <laughs> it is wild. I don't think. I don't think a lot of people had that one. Had that one slotted in. I do think like the top eights of this week are a little deceptive because there wasn't a Stompy deck between the two top eights, was there? No, the closest thing was this Sultai, this Sultai quote-unquote mid-range deck. It, you know, it wasn't that far. I mean, it does have hot four hostage taker for the Scarab God and the old school, you know, blossoming defense to protect the hostage taker. But, like, you know, it's got Land of Elf, and it's got lots of green creatures. All right, so... It's even got a little twist, you know, the two, two plus two wild two growth plus walker. Two, yeah. So, the... The Sultai Midrange deck played by Alexander Gordon Brown in the European Grand Prix was far and away my favorite deck of the weekend. I, it, dude, this looks like your kind of jam. This deck is awesome, right? Complete so, with a Vivian Reed in the sideboard. Oh, Reed. Oh, Vivian Reed. With, the, with Vivian Reed's beautiful hair and long bow. Anyway, like, so Wild Growth Walker. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are you trying to say? I'm saying that Vivian Reed is putting an arrow in in Lyra Dawnbringer and and that's it. Take okay. that Grixis, take that, you know, Nickel Bolas. So I'm Vivian Reed can put a arrow in my dog. Wait, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Wild Growth Walker. Yes. One and a G for a one three creature. So it starts out as like a pretty good blocker if you're playing against red aggro, right? This is fine. <laughs> um, Dude, I want two cost one three is not a pretty <laughs> good blocker. That's it. Yeah, so <laughs> it, it, that's not even the thing, right? So if you just go like Wildworth Walker on turn two, did it live? Okay, sweet. Untap Jade Light Ranger. I mean, it's on already now, right? It is on. and That's a good combo. If Jade Light Ranger reveals another Explore creature, my God, is it on? Like, Wildworth Walker is just like, uh, plus two, plus two, gain six, right? Like, th- there's two more copies in the sideboard, and you could just literally be in these situations where you're like, double Wild Growth Walker in play, cast an Explore guy, chain Explore guy into Explore guy. I mean, this card is like basically Tarmogoyf plus Loxodon hierarch uh, against Mono Red sometimes. And <laughs> like, it's, 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 like, it's just insane how good this card is, specifically in, in those situations. Uh, and you're combining it in this strategy that has both like the speed of Land of War Elves and Servant of the Conduit and like an insane amount of card advantage up to and including not one, not two, not three, but four copies of the Scarab God. Dude, four hostage taker for the Scarab God is that's the sign of somebody committed, like committed to the plan. And blossoming defense to protect it all. I mean, like, I, I think that this deck, it, like many decks, this deck could probably be improved. 
but it is it is far and away my favorite deck. Like, the, there's some things I don't understand about this deck, right? Like, but I'm sure that Alexander Gordon Brown put some thought into it before uh, before sleeving it up. Like, okay, this deck can clearly accomplish double B if it wants to. Like, why is there no Vraska's Contempt anywhere, right? Instead, this is an Adventurous Impulse deck. I guess he's got only 23 lands, and he's got Hostage Taker, as well as the Scarab God for, for Endgame, so maybe Adventurer's Impulse is awesome there. But, like, isn't Confiscation Coup weird instead of instead of uh, Vraska's Contempt at the top? No, nah, I don't know, man. It depends. Control Magic, man. But it's not really even an energy deck, right? Like, Control Magic. Like, I, I I'm not into that card. I, I'm not sure about Aethersphere Harvester, which... Aethersphere Harvester... That's another energy card! Sure. Sure it is. I, this isn't really an energy deck, right? So wait, are you... So you like you like this deck better than, like, Ian Plants's uh, uh, Green-Black Constrictor deck? It had a lot of similar construction, but it's got two Vraska's Contempt, four Raven... So it's got four Ravenous Chupacabra instead of the four Hostage Taker, and two Vraska's Contempts and a main deck Vivian Reed. I mean, like... I'm just, I'm not... A, I, you just like, you like the four, the Scarab God better than four Verderous Gear Halt? I mean, yes, I do. Um, I think, like, obviously, the const- it's hard to look better than the Constrictor decks when you untap successfully with a Constrictor in play on turn three, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's real hard to look better than them in that situation. But I think, like, the... The, the variety of draws and like the top end capability of the Sultai mid range deck is really attractive to me. Like, like I think like being able to go off with wild, wild growth Walker and generate a ton of card advantage from explore guys, hostage taker and the scarab God is really, really exciting to me. Um, I don't understand the confiscation coups, but outside of that, I think this deck is, is more awesome. Uh, the constrictor deck. It's, I mean, obviously this, this strategy is tried and true. It's it's been it's been putting up numbers since these cards have been printed. Um, that I don't know. I, I I think it's weird to have two Vrasis Contempts and one one Planeswalker for your quote unquote spells in a thirty three creature deck. But then this is not the deck to play Adventurous Impulse, right? Like that seems really weird, especially when you're uh No, I mean Alexander Gordon Brown's playing for Adventurous Impulse. No, I'm talking about Ian Plants, right? His spells are two Brasses Contempt and a Vivian Reed. Ah, right? uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Like yeah. this, like if if you're playing a four X Chupacabra deck, and for that matter, a four X Ballista, four X uh, Vertiscure Hulk deck, I think this is the deck that might want to shave some of those numbers and go Adventure Impulse. Um, that's uh, just a thought. Um, it, it seems like it would make sense to me, and it also would give you the opportunity to shave Dude. one of these lands. Dude, why, why, why adventurous impulse when you can just shape her sanctuary to fix your mana? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you could. I, I don't know. I, I think Fedge was playing main deck shape her sanctuary for a while, wasn't he? He's the type. He might. I mean, like, I, I think that the adage of the the people who follow the moto grinders is Fedge is the only one who could actually win with black green constrictor. But he's always putting up a new constrictor deck, and and it's always getting chatter on the message boards. So. Um, I, I think that he was playing main deck shapers, uh, sanctuary for a while. I think I read that somewhere. I can believe it. Probably your, uh, Manhattan millionaires mailing list. Um, my Manhattan millionaires mailing list doesn't ever talk about 60 card decks. So no, <laughs> the closest <sighs> thing was recently there was an interesting thread, which was like, why is there one mountain and four bane fires in the sideboard of this mono white weenie deck? And it's actually the coolest answer because you attack and then they settle the wreckage you and then you go get the mountain and then they're dead. Right? Like you're white weenie, right? And then you're like, oh, there's white weenie. Like settle you, get a mountain. Bane fire is uncounterable now. Yup. <laughs> that is cool. That is cool technology. But that is the extent. <laughs> That's of pretty dope. Yeah, it's the extent. That, of the that reminds cards. me. That reminds me of like an Ice Age Alliances block when the technology. Like you're playing like uh, so you're playing like blue white uh, blue white red control, yeah. you know like force of wills and counter spells and yoko hops pyroclasm incinerate swords to plow shares blinking spirit thawing glacier Keldron outpost that type of stuff. So your opponent's playing necro, 
And so, like, they've got a really, really big advantage in many ways. You know, like, they're ice quaking your glacier, and they're just, like, you know, necroing and consulting. And, you know, it's a, it's just a bad scene. Well, the whole thing, like, they try, the Necrodex want to keep you off of y- Yoko Hops. And the way they would do that is by uh, playing Infernal Darkness, the two black black enchantment with a cumulative upkeep so that, like, all land produces black instead of its normal color. Yeah. But if you're crafty, I saw Eric Taylor sideboard in four copies of Soul Burn in his blue-white-red deck with no way to cast it. Yeah. <laughs> because he was just going to rely on eventually the way the game is going to go. They always necro down to, like, seven, lock you out, and then you, while you're quote unquote locked out, suddenly you switch it on them and you just drain them and they die. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, oh, I, yeah. think he, I think he probably developed that after I Infernal Darkness him for a PT slot. But <laughs> he was playing the Yokel Hop deck and I certainly Infernal Darkness him for a PT slot. So that was my first pro tour. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I think you left your mark on him. He's like, how am I going to beat this thing? <laughs> So yeah, no, awesome, awesome. Yeah. So that was a uh, that was a good beat. Like, um, was there like some sort of sacrifice a creature to to like deal damage? Uh, some sort of catapult thing? I remember a blue white mm-hmm. deck sided that skull in, catapult. Yeah, so, uh, sided that in to kill my my pump knights. I was really impressed before I killed him with uh, you know having fat ten more cards than he had. That was, <laughs> <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> Like, Dude, that format was so great for people going, oh, yeah. Like The number of people that did something against me where I was just like, oh, yeah, that's that's pretty cool before I killed them. It was so high. It was like that was format was really interesting. I think I played like 66 people were in that PTQ. Three of them played Necro. All of us were in the top eight. Two of us played against each other in the finals. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I used to really love that format. You know, fortunately, I qualified the first time I played it yeah. and never had to play it again because uh, in practicing for one of EDT's uh, PTQs, I quickly determined that I did not like playing with neck. When like, if anybody else doesn't honor the gentleman's agreement to not play with Necropotents, <laughs> the the whole format is lost. Yeah, that was a. I like I like that format a lot. I uh, I only ever played it once. <laughs> you probably didn't have to play against Necro that much. I played against Eric Eric Lauer in the finals, and he demolished me. <laughs> demolished. How many slots? Two, two. Of course. Then, then then you win. I I won fine. All right. So uh, back to 2018. Yes. Um. So back to life. I think. Back. I, I like this Constrictor deck. I mean, I think it's just like, I love Walking Ballista. Obviously, Walking Ballista is at its best in this strategy. Um, but I, do, I think that Two Brass's Contempts and No Adventures is Impulse is just weird. That's all. Okay. Yeah. And there's like, he's only got one Brass's Contempt in the sideboard. Like, I could I could live with just Two Brass's Contempts, I think. I don't think I would love it, but I could live with it. But I can't stomach the idea of not playing Adventurous Impulse once you've, you're this mono creature. Yeah, like... I mean, you're 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 in the same camp as me, right? Like, uh, if, unless you're considering cards specifically, like Teferi, right? Or, I mean, uh, outside of Teferi and uh, and Goblin Chain Whirler, like Brass is sometimes basically the best card in the format, right? Like, it, it's no, no, <laughs> no, that's hyperbolic. No, man, I think yeah, I mean, I think Teferi and Chain Whirler, but what about the Scarab God? I guess the Scarab God is good. I mean, I think... What about Torrential is, Gear Hulk? That guy's good. I, I don't know. I think sometimes Brass's Contempt is better than Torrential Gear Hulk. I, dep- I think it depends on what's going on. But Brass's Contempt, I feel like you want it, it, it... Not that you always want it, but you're generally happy to draw it in almost every matchup. And it overperforms in ways that you might not have anticipated before the game started. Like the, I'm those, saying, okay, the value over replacement... Because, like, what if you just played with a different one, right? Like, you could play with Never Return, and it wouldn't be as good, but you could play it. What in the world would you play if you didn't have Teferi? I mean, <laughs> a different deck. 
<laughs> my approach deck just wouldn't have to fairy. I would just have four glimmer of genius instead and cross my fingers and I wouldn't win any of the games. End of sentence. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Um, yeah, you would just win different games. Uh, obviously, Teferi is the most defining card of the current standard. Um, but I, I, I don't know. Would you uh, you consider for sure that Brass's Contempt is a top ten card, though? Right? <laughs> Easily. Easily. Yeah, I'm giving, I'm giving you a hard time. Yeah, no, it's it's. <laughs> yes, I think it is. I think it's a top ten card. So, uh, and that's counting all the stuff. Like I think. I, for instance, I think like Glorybringer, for instance, is still a pretty insane card. Oh, I mean, yeah, right? Glory, Glorybringer does not. I get think Vraska's, I think Vraska's contempt is so well positioned. You know that that might be the distinction. I think the Vraska's contempt is super high on power anyway, and it's well positioned. You know what's impressive to me about Glorybringer is Glorybringer seems to do outstanding even in matchups that like you're like, oh, this isn't the matchup that it's for. Like, it, you know, it's not smashing creatures on the way in or anything. It's got a pretty high floor. Yeah, but it's still a 4-4 four, four flying haste for five. Like, that's not bad at all. Like, that is very solid at smashing people in the face consistently. Mm, it will you're, get a you're, shot in. Yes. Your Ohio brethren, uh, Broham, I guess, uh, Worth Wolpert, uh, top aided that uh, my, the first tournament I ever played in with Eric Lauer uh, back in that whole Ice Age Thawing Glacier sort of era with an air elemental. Okay, air he, won, elemental. he won that regionals. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Yes, won the regionals with air elemental. Three air elemental and was his only way to win. Oh, he had to disintegrate also. When when you've got air elemental and you're putting down W's. Man, think of what some think of what Worth could do today with if with Glorybringer. Oh my God, he could. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. Could bring some back money. to 2018. Uh, but yeah, I think the Vraska's contempt is excellent in the format, and uh, in particular, you know the uh, the fact that it's so big, hitting the Scarab God or Teferi or Rekindling Phoenix. You know, and that's to say nothing of the interaction, all the little things, right? Like, it's just that everybody has something that is A-plus to Vraska's Contempt. Yeah, I mean, when you look at this Constrictor deck, like, even when you point out, like, Rekindling Phoenix, it has two Vraska's Contempt, but it's not, like, great at fighting Rekindling Phoenix. You know, like, Chupacabra is just, like, full-on okay at fighting Rekindling Phoenix, and unless you've got like a pretty substantial like material advantage, like the Phoenix could just come back, you know, that's the, that's the thing. Like maybe you've got like active ballista or something. It's just, and, not, it's not a replacement it, for Brass's contempt. And even though Hazret didn't have the greatest week, still puts up some numbers and he'll be back. And man, just the Chupacabra, just not as good as Vraska's contempt in that matchup. No, I mean, Hazret, I think is this, this card that just, doesn't get enough respect either. Like, that card is absolutely unstoppable for some decks. Now, obviously, if you're, like, blue-white approach and you've got, like, Cast Out and Seal Away and, um, you know, Settle the Wreckage, it's not that you never lose to Hazard. You still lose to Hazard plenty, right? You just lose to Hazard less than everybody else. But, you know, if you're, if you're other colors that aren't white, I mean, that card is just not easy to deal with. It does a ton of damage and has an amazing rate. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really powerful. I think it's just one of those deals where the fact that Chandra, Hazaret, Rekindling Phoenix, they're all just so absurd that, uh, you know, I think it ends up leading to one of those spots where uh, you can only play so many of the fours. Um, yeah. I mean, and some, some of these uh, red and red black maniacs play Karn also. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. Um, speaking of Red Black Maniacs, just uh, can we look at Giordano uh, Fagiolo's Red Black Aggro deck from the European Grand Prix? Yeah. So this deck um, is like a mostly red deck. So I just want to get your take on this. So he's like essentially a red aggro deck, right? So this is the haste deck. He's got four Bowmat Courier. He's got some on crop crashers, uh, etc. right? So... It's the haste deck. It beats 24 lands in the main deck, 
20 Mountain, 4 Dragon Skull Summit, and the Dragon Skull Summits are only supporting Scrap Heap Scrounger and, like, nothing else anywhere, right? I mean, I guess right. the, the back of ribbons. ribbons. Right, yeah. So Mostly like, just the Scrounger. So what is your take on this? I mean, obviously we can compare this to the to like that super rush uh, wizards 19 land deck, which I think is a, is a radically different archetype, even though it has so many cards uh, in, in common. But what do you think about this versus just like the regular straight red, you know, red aggro deck versus red, black. I, I mean, I still like splashing black. I don't think a ton has changed. I, st- I still like splashing black, like the full black splash, like the Owen Turton wild type deck, not, yeah, yeah, I still like splashing the black, not just the scrounger. I like actually having some black cards and enough mana to cast black cards. Um, okay. Like I, I, I think like it's it's so interesting to me, like that standard has this wealth of red decks that you know, they have so many cards in common, right? Like most of them play a braid and Bomac Courier and at least some number of hazards, but they're so distinct from one another. Like they, they actually just play very differently from each other. Yeah. Oh, actually, you had mentioned earlier Stompy. I wanted to see if you had had a chance to see uh, Pedro Justy's Steel Leaf Stompy over in the the top 16 in um, Orlando. I think it was the highest finishing, uh, the highest finishing one. And it was one of those that splashed blue uh, in order to support just a little bit of permission in the main deck, you know, in the form of one spell pierce to commit to memory. And then in the sideboard, having access to uh, four negates and then a few miscellaneous, you know, a spell pierce here and uh, a river's rebuke, you know, your signature card, oh, you know, all that. I mean, river's rebuke is, I mean, especially coming out of a stompy deck, like that's yeah. not the thing that you're expecting. But man, if that thing, st- first of all, if that thing sticks in a matchup that you want to see it, right, that means it's, <laughs> it's going to be doing some work. Right, and then separately, when it does, you probably have enough material on your side of the of the battlefield that it might just be game, right? Yeah, and actually, I did want to mention uh, the fog deck, the Nexus of Fate deck. It did better than these top eights are suggesting. There was actually a bunch of uh, Nexus of Fate in the top thirty-two. So don't get it twisted. Uh, and there was a lot of variation. You know, like uh, some people played Supreme Will and Charter Course as, uh, as a little bit different of card draw. Some people mixed up uh, the, the main deck and put a little permission in. You know, like uh, Supreme Will in particular as a way to get card draw while also having options for interaction. Some people played Lyra Dawnbringer in the sideboard as part of a transformational plan. You know, like uh, a pretty good variety of different types of moves being pulled by people, uh, you know, running these these uh, Nexus of Fate decks. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at Peter Ingram's deck. Uh, what do you think about the Nissa Steward of Elements, uh, which seems to be showing up as like a one of in the main deck? Um, is that I, I don't know. Okay, how ornamental is this versus versus, you know, high impact uh, of, a, of a singleton in the, in the archetype, do you think? It's uh, certainly a way to win, right? It's an alternate victor condition if that's what you really need, but I just don't think that's what it's really. I don't think that's the make or break point, uh, you know, part of this this deck's matchups. But it could be. I mean, it's a fine card, you know. Obviously, uh, the I thought it was a little interesting though the um, the amount of other niche blue decks that uh, put up finishes, um, like uh, Mono Blue Storm. Like, uh, one of the people, let's see, Luke Feeney played a Mono Blue Storm, and it's not really Mono Blue, Splash, Splash Red for Joyra, Weatherly Captain. But uh, this, the, the, the crux of the deck is four Paradoxical Outcome, four Psy Master Thopterist, and four Inspiring Statuary, with a bunch of cheap artifacts and cantrip artifacts, you know, Mox Amber, Prophetic Prism, Renegade Map, Navigator's Compass, all that stuff, and uh, two Aether Flux Reservoir to win with. So, Psy Master Thopterist is a new card from M19, and this is the card that, like, because there have been Paradoxical Outcome Aether Flux Reservoir decks before, right? Psy oh, yeah. is the card that is... I don't know, pushing it over the top, but, like, making this archetype worth exploring. Oh, yeah. Right? I th- That's the... 
that is single handedly the that is. I mean, don't get me wrong, Joyra helps a little, but mostly Psy Master Thopterist is why this deck is like a legit, legit deck. This is a real deck. Like the when you have Psy Master Thopterist down, the one one flying Thopter you get from each of your artifacts. It's like a whole extra card. Yeah, it's like a mox, right? Like, that's the thing. So, like, you get... Well, it's not just the extra... I mean, it does function sort of like a mox for some of your uh, inspiring statuary shenanigans, where it's like, you know, all your artifacts are mana flaring now. But it's also just every one of those 1-1 flyers could potentially be a threat or a blocker, but every one of them is also a legal target for paradoxical outcome. So you can just go turn three Psy, drop your Mox Amber, get a Thopter, tap the Mox Amber because Psy is a legend, cast Navigator's Compass or a Renegade Map or whatever, you know, to play a Navigator's Compass, get another Thopter and gain three life. Then on your fourth turn, when you Paradoxical Outcome, it's already plus five. Because you can, and you can keep going. You can do more stuff. Well, because that's what happens when you cast Paradoxical Outcome, right? You have fuel to do more stuff. Right, and heaven forbid you actually are in a game state where you have, like, an Inspiring Statuary that you get to keep in play. Because if you get to keep Psy and keep Inspiring Statuary both in play, wow, can you go off. You know, because, like, you Paradoxical Outcome, even for, like, four or five cards, and then you just get to keep replaying them, and now you have, like, eight more... Like, you have all these extra permanents. Because, like, you need to replay all those cards. And every Thopter that you bounce to your hand and drew a new card, it's like you're replaying all the artifacts that have made those Thopters in the first place, but it's like your Brain Geyser was twi- twice as strong. So, uh, you know, and that's not counting stuff like Metal Spinner's Puzzle not re-triggering and the Prophetic Prism re-triggering. And then obviously you can, uh, you can thopter them out if you want, but sometimes you're going to just dig to an Aetherflux Reservoir and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know. I mean, the, the thing that excites me the most about this archetype is the Baral's expertise, right? Like, I think, I, I feel like that card can just go wild, right? It's, it's a, it's a, just going to dump a big card onto the table if you wanted to, and it's going to buy you time or it, or it can further your own material for, uh, you know, the accumulation of, um, of more action on your side of the, uh, of the table. So I know it sounds funny, yeah, but you can actually fix your mana with it. So those two Joyras, there's only three land in the deck that can even cast them. And this is another 19 land deck, by the way. 19 land, one mountain, two sulfur falls, 12 island for Zalfir and Void. Yeah, but you've now, got, of course, Renegade you've got Mox, Map and, and Prophetic and, Prism. And Navigator's Compass and Prophetic Prism and Mox Amber. But right, like at the same time, there are going to be spots in which you want to bounce everything to your hand. You might not have a permanent input. You might not have a way to play Joyra. It doesn't come to that very often. But. I, I, I'm actually not the hugest fan of Joyra in this archetype. Like... I just think like too slow. Yeah, well, it's a three, three for four, and it's and like so many of the cards that you're going to catalyze with having Joyer in play are played at sorcery speed. So like, uh, I mean, sure you can just cast one, right? But it's on the stack, and you get a trigger, and they just like abrade her, you know, or like lightning strike her, or whatever, or it. It's just dead, and then you used four mana, and maybe you cantripped. Like I just think like it's it's really low. Um, it, you're you don't get very much out of the power on Joyra, right? So this is like a three three body for four. Like Psy Master Thopterus at one four is a way more impressive body for three mana, I think, than Joyra Weatherlight Captain, just because lives through you know, commonly played removal cards like Lightning Strike or Wizard's Lightning, etc. Um, so, I don't know, I just, she doesn't do anything for me. All right, what about on the other side of the ocean? Uh, a different breed of, uh, this is back more on the stompy tip, but kind of fused, uh, the red-green deck. It was like, a, you know, sort of half stompy, half red aggro. You know, Glorybringer, Rekindling Phoenix... Steel Leaf Champion, 
Vine Mayor Voltaic Brawler. Uh, Glenn Muyen. 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 14th with uh, the Red Green Monsters deck, but with one Bane Fire main deck. Uh, and one Adventures Impulse. I, you know what I dislike about this deck is the Green Belt Rampagers. They just. They do nothing for me. Um, I, I think, like, the that card is is not at its at its strength in a in a deck with this in, intensity of of mana requirements whether you look at like steel leaf champion or like the double red and rekindling phoenix and glory bringer i feel like when you're playing cards like that that the bar for how good your early drops is gets raised like yeah i mean obviously it can do stuff like crew a heart of kirin right or you know, produce energy to make Voltaic Brawler better. But it's just, like, it's weird to me to play that card in a deck like this and, like, not have Llanowar Elves. Not having Llanowar Elves blows my mind. Like, it's, like <laughs> it makes no sense to me, right? Like, obviously, this deck is mostly, if not totally, immune to Goblin Chain Whirler, but, like... I don't know. I, I just don't think. I don't think that not playing land or dude, the chain roller's still going to get its money against the rekindling egg. It's just. I mean, I just can't see playing green belt rampager instead of land or elves. It's just. I don't see it. That's all. Dude, the the combination of green belt rampager, steel leaf champion. You know that's exhibit A. Yeah. And four mountains, four aether hub, and a timber gorge. <laughs> I can't handle it. I can't. I, do I it. just that, that's that's what I'm saying. Right? Like, if you're playing cards like this, like the bar is literally raised on some part of your deck, right? Like if you're the Steel Leaf champion and there's three Steel Leaf champions and no Llanowar Elves, like that makes no sense. Like the whole point of playing Steel Leaf champion is you go Forest Llanowar Elf and they go like tap land and you're like turn two five four. You got me because if you don't, I got you. Right. Like that's the point of playing that card, like playing that card on turn five because you drew, you know, mountain. <laughs> like It's just not or you're like your rando, like red green like Timberland Gorge came into came into play tapped on turn three. It's just it's just not in in sync with having a card like Steel Leaf Champion like that. No. Card, that card is like the definition and standard of. I got my cards. This is like my explosive draw, right? And then to not play four copies and to not play the card that makes it best is, yeah, I just, I can't, I, it, when yeah, I, I can't see even. the red green monsters deck that makes me happy, I'm going to be in love, right? But every time we go over one, I just, something always rubs me wrong about him. Yeah, I don't think this is the format for him. I don't think it's time. Nah, not not when you can be playing all those explore triggers to gain three life and plus one. That, that that's a green deck for me. Okay. <sighs> yep. 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 Well, all and right, it's man. Sixty-one cards. Yeah, that's. I didn't even want to. I didn't even want to put them out on blast like that. Oh man, no. I. Uh, not not my favorite card of the weekend. Not my favorite deck of the weekend, rather. Yep. All right, man. Well, uh, what would you play next week? Uh, I would play dragons, but of the decks that we of the decks we talked about, I think I would try the uh, the soul time mid range deck with four copies of the scarab god. Yeah, but, but, I uh, I I like that one for trying for new information. Yeah, and if I just got to shuffle up and play, I'm playing uh, Wafo. Style. Or um, basically, it's not really Waffo style. It's mostly just Miko style. I'll just play Miko style. The the, the Esper with. Uh, I'll just play uh, Waffo's deck exactly. All right. Well, that's probably a, a good a good way to I don't know win a pro tour if you want to play control. Dude, I can't believe like ten turbo fog decks in the top thirty twos. Not no. a good book. All right. See you next week, man. Bye bye. In life didn't work so great Tried to play dredge for jail or hate Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase Your core trapped in amber stasis days Lost a lot of friends got left behind